I'm Sean J. Kennedy, and this is Backstage at the Enharmonic. My guest today is Dame Evelyn Glennie, the world's premier solo percussionist. Her solo recordings exceed 40 albums and are as diverse as her career on stage. A multiple Grammy winner and a British Academy of Film and Television Arts nominee. She has been awarded the Officer of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, OBE, in 1993, and was promoted to Dame Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, DBE, in 2007. She has over 100 international awards to date, including the Polar Music Prize and the Companion of Honor. She took a leading role in the opening ceremonies of the 2012 London Olympics, leading 1,000 drummers on the field. I've been a fan of Dame Evelyn's for over 20 years now, and through that time we've been able to communicate through email and other means, and she's become a great supporter of my projects, and in 2020 she actually collaborated on a virtual video with a group that I formed called the Rolling Buzzards Brigade, where we recorded some old rudimental standards such as Three Camps and Connecticut Halftime. I'm thrilled to present my interview with Dame Evelyn Glenn. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much. Pleasure. No problem at all. How are you? I'm good. How are things for you? Yep. Not too bad, thanks. Yep. Yep. We're just toodling along. Excellent. So today's session, since I live in a drum set camp, more or less, percussion-wise, um, I wanted to talk to you about drum set and find out um, about drum set in your playing career, in your formative years, and some of your favorite players. Gene Krupa was my favorite when I was growing up, yeah. and he's the guy that got me interested in playing drum set. Um, in your formative years, were there any drum set players that uh, specifically influenced you or you admired? Um no, actually, and I don't mean that in an arrogant way. It was just simply I was brought up in a farm in a relatively remote part of northeast of Scotland, and so we weren't exposed to music in that kind of way. So the music that we were exposed to were um, when relatives came over and we would then start singing Scottish traditional music, traditional songs, um, our music in schools were often based on the Scottish traditional music and so on, and because it linked to the Scottish traditional dance. Mm -hmm. And this is something mm -hmm. that the kids did, you know, when they were when they were young. And I went to a tiny uh, country primary school that only had 37 pupils in the entire school. Oh, so nice. our music was very general, you know, and I just simply did not have the means to find any, you know, exotic percussion or anything like that. But however, when I reached the age of 12 and went into a much larger secondary school, a lot of the schools in those days had school orchestras, school bands, recorder groups, choirs, you name it. And so as a new, fresh 12-year-old into the school, I saw the school orchestra play during one assembly for the new pupils. And that was when I was introduced to percussion. And, uh, and of course, you know, again, it was very rare for families to have, in those days, record players and things like that. So any music was really coming through the television, what we happened to see through TV. And uh, we didn't have people come in and give master classes and workshops and that kind of thing. It just wasn't where we were at that point, you know. So a lot of the inspiration was literally from school teachers, from your fellow school colleagues and so on. And uh, and that was that. And, and my influence was very much the peripatetic percussion teacher. And he came from an army background. And the army musicians were very good musicians. They were really skilled musicians. So they were skilled in composing and arranging in all sorts of musicianship type of things, as well as being instrumentalists. And that's why when I started our uh, percussion teacher at school, and he came in you know, every Monday, once a week, um, he saw all of us as sound creators first and foremost, then musicians, and then percussionists. 
because the thing that glued us all, whether you were a trumpet player, a percussionist, a clarinetist, whatever, was that we create sound. That's what we do, you know, regardless of the tools that we have to, to, to do that, that we are sound creators. And, uh, and so again, you know, the Aberdeen happened to be the closest city, which was about 15 miles away to the school that I went to. And it had one music store, and it was mainly a piano music store, a, a store that sold, sold pianos. And in those days, organs, you know, a lot of folk were buying, you know, home organs and things like that. That was the kind of in thing. And then gradually hi-fi systems, you know, came into play and, and all sorts of things. And um, But they uh, had an educational snare drum on the shelf high up somewhere in the shop and a pair of drumsticks and a premier practice pad. And once I started percussion, you know, I was fairly eager to ask my parents if they would, you know, care to buy a, a, a snare drum for me for maybe a Christmas or something. And uh, but in my mind, I had this vision of a nice shiny shell of a drum and so on. And the shop had this kind of dingy brown, you know, tiny little uh, educational instrument. But of course, my parents didn't know, you know, the difference between this drum or that drum. And so uh, they bought this drum for me and uh, for one Christmas and I opened it up and I, I was so disappointed with it. But obviously I didn't tell them that, you know, I said, thank you very much. Right. But really disappointed however having said all of that this drum became almost like an extension of my limbs and as a young player I played and played and played and played on it and you know it just and I still have the drum I still have my first pair of drumsticks and I still have that practice pad and they mean the world to me and obviously I'm not using those for concerts the drum would just sort of you know fall to bits and in one right. strike you know, as a youngster, this is this is really all you needed. So a lot of the inspiration came from my percussion teacher. And what he did was that because we didn't have drum method books or systems or anything like that, was that we worked from pieces of music. So literally, we, we would be one minute using a ragtime piece, a piano, Joplin, you know, ragtime piece. The next minute, a bit of Bach. The next minute, a flute. 4A piece, the next minute, you know, a bit of jazz and, you know, it, uh, next minute Scottish traditional, whatever it might have been. And he would say to us, right, take this phrase, let's say it was of, of a Bach partita uh, for violin or, or wh whatever it, it could be, cello, it doesn't matter. And he would say to us, well, what time signature is it in? It might have been in D minor, G major, G minor, whatever it is. And he would ask us to digest the rhythm of that. Now, let's say you have a partita and it goes whatever it is. So you see these ebbs and flows, you know, like a bit of scenery. And he would ask us, well, what does G minor feel like? Now, G minor might feel lonely or it might feel sparse or it might feel... Um, threatening or it might feel whatever you want it to feel what does it feel for you so he would ask us to play this on a snare drum so we would be looking at the rhythm now rhythmically it was da 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 phrase wise we were seeing all of these pictures going up and down up and down up and down and all the dynamics bye Brenda and uh and then with this feeling of g minor that affects your sense of touch. So is it present? Is it distant? Is it light? Is it gentle? Is it loving? You know, is it aggressive? Is it frustrating? What kind of feel does that G minor, D minor, F major, whatever it is, give you? And that will determine how then you play the rhythm coupled with and this is then your snare drum piece of music that happens to be a partita. So your whole body changes when you're thinking about that kind of way of, of, of approaching something. But always it stems from a piece of music. 
and that's been my kind of little journey. That's where I start from in in any any piece that I engage with. So it's never just our rhythm, our note, our whatever else is being isolated. Is that you're bringing all of those elements together as a sound creator. Then the musician has to understand that phrase, you know, the beginning, the middle, and the end. And then you need t- tools to do that. So in our case, it's percussion. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it, that's then where you, you have to make your tools into this kind of sound meal or sound diet. So it, that, that's kind of it, really. So you're not thinking of whether you're a, playing like a pop musician or playing like a Latin musician or playing like an orchestral musician or whatever. You're playing with what does it feel like and what does it feel like for... What, the, what I have available, which is a body that's five foot two, relatively short arms, you know, stubby hands, whatever, this is the engine I have to work with. So I can't play like a six foot person or a three foot person. I, this is the weight I am, the size I am, what I have to work with, manipulate the tools I have with, what I feel with that G minor or A flat major or whatever. And that's that, really. And that's why everybody has that individual sound. That's really fascinating. It reminds me of um, like Buddy Rich or one of the great drum set soloists. Um, when you hear their drum set solos, you can actually hear the tune that the band was playing. You can hear the melody and the ebb and flow. So it's kind of he's doing the same thing or the great drum set soloist. They'll Whatever their solo they're constructing is, is based on the melody, harmony, emotion coming from what has happened before. So that's a really interesting connection. Yeah, it's very cool. True, and it's funny, you know, when you look at production concertos, and you'll often see, you you know, obviously the notated pieces, the the notation of the piece itself, and then cadenza. And Mm -hmm. it's just sort of little box, you know, (laughs) that says cadenza. And, you know, in most other pieces, either the cadenza will be written out, or if we think of the, the great composers and performers in Beethoven's day, Mozart's day, Haydn and so on, they were great improvisers and they would improvise on the spot, you know. And we've kind of lost that art with mm-hmm. a lot of uh, melodic aspects, like melodic instruments when it comes to concerto playing and so on. But somehow for percussionists, composers feel, oh, well, they, they improvise, you know, all the, all of the time. And, and a lot of times after I've played a concerto, sometimes audience members may say, so what's that piece written down, you know, or did you just make it up, you know, and, which is really interesting. So you've kind of got this sort of contrast of cadenzas where they're just this blank box, but then the audience thinking that you, you've improvised the whole piece, you know. <laughs> So it's it's funny, but you're right. And what what this kind of highlights with players is are the players who can pick up on exactly as you said, you know, the the melodic aspects, the harmonic aspects, the energy of the piece, the overall arch of the piece, you know, and all sorts of things. If you think of the Joseph Schwartner percussion concerto, which is a well-known piece of music cadenza at the end, you know, almost at the end of the piece. Mm -hmm. And for the players who can consider all of the material that has come and has made that piece of music, they will draw upon that. For the players who think, ah, cadenza, right, I can now create the things that I've been practicing, you know, and it suddenly becomes a completely different piece and I can alter then, you know, this, it's always an interesting exercise for students, I think, to develop the art of improvisation based on a, an actual piece of music, mm-hmm. you know, um, and and that's something that you can practice and you can develop for sure. So somebody like Buddy Rick was obviously a complete and utter master at that. Right. I remember I was doing a, some sort of master class with a jazz band around here, and uh, they were playing Van Morrison's Moon Dance. Um, <laughs> so they're swinging, and for whatever reason, the director allowed the drummer to play a solo in the middle of the tune, which was a weird choice to begin with. But I'm watching and analyzing, and they're playing the tune as Van Morrison played it. It was nice and smooth and easy. And then she pointed to the drummer. And it was like he said, I can play paradiddles this fast. I can play flams this fast. And it was just like boots in a dryer. It was like, I'm like, whoa. I'm like, hey, hey, hey. 
And then I had to have the talk with him, like, what's the song about? It, yeah. Who's he singing about? And then he was like, oh, it's kind of a love song. I'm like, right. I'm like, so we had to bring those elements into it to get his drums to sound more lovely, I guess is the word. Yeah, yeah, no, or some divorce, you know, all of a sudden. Right. I'm like, you scared her away, man. Like, come on, settle down. <laughs> so... Yeah, uh, Rant, we mentioned Buddy Rich and a couple others. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had this um, type of fantasy, but if you could have played with one band, Beatles, Who, Led Zeppelin, I don't know. Uh, do you have any sort of fantasy like, wow, I wish I would have loved to have played drum set with these particular musicians? <laughs> oh, goodness. I, I'm not sure if I could just pick one in, in particular, but, you know, there's there's a lot of really interesting instances. I mean, I would have loved to um, have played with Queen, for example, mm -hmm. and taken oh. Roger Taylor's seat, simply because, you know, the operatic style of playing, the ebbs and flows, you know, and the, the sudden changes, and where, in a way, the drumming can be quite orchestral, or it, mm -hmm. it, it, it can be more rock-like, or whatever it is, there's just ways that you could explore different orchestration within the drum set, you know, <laughs> itself, really. I think I think that's interesting. Um, I think also a band like Police, you know, thinking about Stuart Copeland and, and all of the little subtleties and intricacies of time and placement of beats. And, and uh, again, you know, it's very orchestral. It's not always the obvious that comes out. And I felt that, you know, you know, just as we've been talking about cadenzas and, and you know, putting all of your vocabulary in, in one cadenza, as it were, you know, that, that sort of tastefulness in what police requires is, is an art, you know, completely, and sometimes less is definitely more um, in, in that instance. Um, I think in a way where I'm learning quite a bit at the moment about drumming is through Ed Sheeran. And of course, he doesn't use a drummer, but he is the drummer. And when you look at how he structures a song and how he becomes the, the percussion of his song through his style of guitar playing, um, through his rhythm, through the building up of the layers when he's using his foot pedal, pedals and so on, that's really interesting. Um, you know, you could almost take what he does and plant that on a drum kit. Um, mm -hmm. and, and try and suss out, you know, what's happening there. And so it isn't always just, you know, looking at drummers that we can learn about our, our art form. It, it can be other mediums as, as well. Um, but, I mean, I remember my first ever drum book that I bought um, was the Ginger Baker drum book. And I think mm -hmm. I bought it because of the cover. The, you know, there it was, and two and great big bass drums, you know. Oh, wow, that's amazing. A massive kit, you know, toms everywhere. And uh, and then, you know, going through the book, and and I had just uh, obtained uh, a seven-piece Black Shadow Premier drum kit. And this was something that, you know, was a treasure for me to have, you know, as, as a... Uh, uh, a student and I saved up for this and, and goodness knows and and it was just like a, a a real I mean it took up the whole of the bedroom and I couldn't play it normally because you know I was in an upstairs flat and all sorts of things so all these towels were over it but nevertheless and this ginger baker drum book you know on the music stand and there I was yeah <laughs> not with the two bass drums I have to say but you know and and it, so yes he was a, a big kind of influence as it were you know in, in getting to grips with with kit playing as a young player wow um that ed sheeran uh, point you made was really interesting do you um or have you messed around with loops or any sort of computer playing yet or no and loops is something i i'm very interested in i really am and i just haven't got to that point of actually getting on with it mm -hmm. um and I think part of it is is um, I'm not that great with technology and so on, and so I I kind of need to work with somebody on on the the looping thing to know what, what I'm doing and what I'm listening to, what I want to to hear, and all sorts of things. So I think if I find the right person to be in collaboration with um, on that, I would absolutely be 
hundred percent interested in that. Nice. Um, so many years ago, it was in the nineties somewhere. My wife and I met you here in Philadelphia on South Street. You were in a record shop by yourself, and we're like, "That can't be her." And it was you, and you were very gracious. And sadly, it was before <laughs> cell phones. We had a picture, but I don't know where it went. It was on film. Um, I'm just wondering because a couple other folks that I know that are pretty famous um, have wandered into music shops and they've been testing stuff out. I don't know if there's been any funny experiences where you've sat down at a drum set or played a percussion instrument at a local music shop and somebody was like, hey, you're pretty good. You know, you should stick with this. I didn't know if there were any funny things that have happened like that. Um, no, not really. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't dare play in a music store. Um, <laughs> I, I do remember, um, though, going into the record stores in the States because they always had a, a good variety of percussion music, you know, mm -hmm. percussion recordings. And uh, and so sometimes I'd find recordings of things that, um, you know, I wouldn't have found elsewhere. Same in Japan, actually, I'd do the same. I mean, anywhere I could, but they, of course, had a lot of the Japanese players that, you know, were not necessarily available in the UK or even in the States. So... I picked up an awful lot of recordings one way or another. And I just, I was never a big listener of music and never have been. And I'm not a big listener of music, but I wanted to have these in the collection because I knew that some of them you wouldn't necessarily be able to find, you know, in certain circumstances. But certainly when I used to travel with a percussion technician and go into drum stores and percussion stores and that kind of thing, inevitably the shopkeeper would go up to the technician and ask, how can I help you? And they would say, oh, it's not me that's needing the help. It's, it's, it's Evelyn. And then, oh, okay. So, um, so yes. And there was always this kind of feeling that uh, they didn't really know how to, to, to talk to you in a strange kind of way because they couldn't quite place you as a rock drummer. Wow. Um, and so they just then assumed that you were looking for mallets as opposed to sticks or you know, something like that. And so and I would just say, oh, just, you know, let me be. I'm happy to, to just kind of rummage around. And, and inevitably I'd ask, you know, do you have anything interesting under the desk or under the table? Because that's often where the little bits and pieces were. And very often I go into a place in San Francisco whenever I was there, and so many of the interesting little sound effects, shakers, you name it, bits and bobs, were under, you know, certain sort of tables or counters or whatever. And literally, I was on all fours, you know, on my hands and knees, trying to to, to see what was what they happened to have under these nukes and crannies, and and it was fascinating and. Um, until they got to know, you know, oh, here she goes again kind of thing, you know, when I came into the shop and they knew just to let me be. And, but yes, it's, it's, uh, but I can't say that um, I sort of started playing or anything in, in the, in the shops, you know, you know I, yeah, I'd be too embarrassed to do that. <laughs> you mentioned the Schwantner and um, the first piece that um, I was exposed to your playing was Rosaro, uh, Rosaro's marimba. Uh, piece. Um, just a curious question. Do you have a set time? Like if someone asks you to do a concerto, do you say in your own mind or literally say it, I need a year to work on this, a year and a half, or is does it ebb and flow? I don't know. Is there like a it, it does ebb and flow realistically, but I normally start out with six months um, to receive the score and before the first performance. And uh, because you know that you're not going to get anywhere near the six months, but at least you've got the music in your possession. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, and, and, and that can go a long way because it's not six months with your instruments. It's not six months of dedicated practice to only that piece of music. You're going to be traveling around to so many other places, have loads of other projects to deal with, have, have life to deal with in one thing or another that that does not mean, well, you've had six months to learn that piece of music. It doesn't work like that at all. But if somebody says, oh, look, I can't get it to you um, until three months before the, the premiere or something, I would just probably decline it. You know, mm -hmm. I just simply don't want that level of, of, um, of kind of stress, I suppose. You know what I mean? I, I, I want to enjoy the process. 
And a lot of the learning means that you need time to leave the piece. You know, you need time just to let a week, two weeks, whatever go by. Let these days in between just go by whereby you're not touching the piece of music, but you're letting things just sort of sink in and simmer and uh, whilst you do other things. And that's really important. And if you don't have time to do that, it becomes just an exercise of learning the notes, getting a basic kind of interpretation in there. You know, you're not letting it simmer at all. Um, you're just kind of getting by with it. And, and that's a shame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but there are other people who can really learn music very, very quickly and let it happen and magic comes out, you know. But I'm not one of those people. I can read the piece quickly and I can, you know, get the notes, you know, under the sticks quickly. But that isn't enough. So I need the time to just let it simmer, to explore ideas, to just sort of see, oh, yeah, you know what, in the middle of the night, something you might register and you think, oh, that, I might try that. Or, oh, actually, I'm, I'm not sure which way I want to go with this. And, and you need a day or two just for you to think about that. And it's that kind of thing that happens with me, I believe. You said a military instructor was um, your uh, one of your early teachers. Since he was from the military, did you do a lot of rudimental drumming, like traditional rudimental drumming with him? No, no, hardly not a lot at all. We did, um, it was all very much music. I mean, when I say military music is, of course, music. I'm not suggesting otherwise. But it was all very much connected with the kind of organic thing of being a musician if that makes sense yes yeah um, and and I'm, I'm i realize i'm explaining this really quite poorly um but how can i put it it was linking what he what he did was that he wouldn't allow any of us to specialize and so a lot of the young lads of course your 12 year olds 13 year olds and so on wanted to play the drums and but they didn't want to do xylophone or the auxiliary instruments and um, but he wouldn't allow any of that. He absolutely linked the. We only had two hand tuned timpani, you know, the tap timpani, yeah. um, a little xylophone, a little glockenspiel, a drum kit that obviously included the snare drum, and then auxiliary instruments. That's all we had. And but he linked everything up together, you know. And this is what kept our interest with all of the percussion. And even when we played in um, the, the county ensemble, the percussion ensemble, he made sure that we all learned each other's parts so that the timpanist would understand what it felt like to play the xylophone part. The xyl xylophone player would understand exactly what it felt like physically, mentally, everything, musically, to play the timpani part. And that made us connect better. And going back to the kind of Bach or the, the Scott Joplin or the, the whatever kind of music we were playing, you know, all of this was based from a musicianship point of view. So if we took a, a snare drum piece and we didn't have those books, you know, we didn't have the Wilcoxon, we didn't have any of those kind of books, that we had to make up the exercises ourselves. So we might have taken... Uh, uh, a, a rhythm from a bit of poetry. So in the Northeast, we, we speak in what we call the Doric tongue or the Bachan tongue. And so we might have recited poetry such as, said the flesh to the flea in the grand to be me, to be swakin' up bonnie to look at. So we would then notate that as a rhythm. And then, and in that, you've got a lot of the Scott snaps, you know, and then we might add a flam or a drag or a rough or a da-da-da-da-da, you know. And then we would change the sticking of that. So how does that change the inflection of the rhythm? Not just the rhythm, but the inflection of that rhythm. And so, well, sometimes you ended up playing it starting with the left, starting with the right, doing twos, doing threes, doing whatever it is. So it's always related to something, you know, said the flesh to the flea in the grand we meet. Da -da -dun, da -da -dun, da -da -da -dun. You know, you're adding the roles in there. And all of this is related to what dancers do in the Scottish traditional music and what the 
the pipers do, the great Highland pipers do, with the, and all the little twiddly notes that, and the grace notes that they play are all connected to the snare drumming of the Scots snare drums. You've got this triangle going on, you know, with the wow. snare and the piping and the and the, the the dance. And so everything is musical. And when I discovered that when I when I was a, a, a youngster doing the Scottish traditional dance, obviously through school, I was no expert, but we all did it. And then starting the drumming, my dancing suddenly made a lot more sense. And then when I started playing the Great Highland bagpipes in my 20s, I wish to God I'd done that as a youngster. Suddenly my snare drum playing became much more musical and much more kind of, ah, now I get it. You know, wow. it really seemed to drop a lot more. Um, so, yeah, it was interesting. Wow. <laughs> The teacher sounds like he was incredible. Did he get to see um, your rise in uh, fame and ability in the music world? Well, he's still alive. He's, he'll be 90 in August. And I saw he, when he um, when I left school at the age of 16, secondary school at the age of 16, um, he then retired very shortly after that. And he went to live in Crete in, in Greece. Wow. And, uh, and then 25 years later... I happened to um, be part of a, a, the Polar Music Prize in Sweden, and I was given the chance to invite uh, three people to that. And I said, I absolutely would love for Ron Forbes, my school teacher, to, and his wife to come along to that if they, if they can. And that was the first time I'd seen him in 25 years since school days. And then both Ron Forbes and his wife then now or since then split their time uh, between Scotland and Crete. Um, and so now they're full time in Scotland. Um, so I'm hoping that that I can see him uh, COVID, you know, being or if, if we've got that freedom to travel uh, to see him for his 90th birthday later this year. But yes, he has been aware and we keep in touch, you know, for sure. And um and it's he he's been absolutely completely and utterly key to my growth as a musician and a creative person, as indeed was the late James Blades. Mm -hmm. James gave he came into the academy, the Royal Academy of Music, one day a term. Uh, when I was a student, so he was not the main teacher there. He he was a kind of visiting professor one day a term, and I'm telling you, those days I, I would just sort of wait, you know, like a lost dog, as it were, just waiting for him to come, you know. And he was already in his 80s at that time, but a man of such vision, such belief, and you just, I can't express how he listened to people's stories. So, you know, I believed in solo percussion. That's what I wanted to believe in. Um, that's what I wanted to be. And, you know, so many people in those days said, well, you know, it hasn't been done on a full-time basis before. Who's, who's going to listen to a two-hour percussion recital? You know, what are you going to play? There's not enough repertoire. Blah, 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 blah. Orchestras are not going to be playing percussion concertos and so on. And he was the one who said, Evelyn, just put, you know, get on and, and do it. And he was so visionary. And, and you know, I just was so thankful and, and grateful to have those two people, amongst other people, of course, but two people in particular at that young age to say, get on, you know, and, and, and have that very different approach, I think, to the normal kind of, here's a snare drum, this is how you hold the sticks, and da-da-da-da-da. Now, this approach may not have worked for everybody, and I think it, it needs to be made clear that everybody is different, and other people will completely react to a lesson whereby they say, right, here's a snare drum, please hold the sticks like this, and please strike the drum like that. And they will absolutely, you know, grow and be incredible musicians. And um, for me, I needed a more pictorial, story-like approach. Um, and that's how I am as a person. So it just so happened that that, that worked for me. Wow. I just looked on my shelf here. I have James Blade's uh, percussion book, right? It's sitting right there. I think I just saw that they, um, did they just reprint it? I think there was a new yeah. print. 
Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to have to pick that up and compare. Um, I, t- I think mine's about 20 years old now, so I have to see what new edition, new stuff is in there. <laughs> it's still um, a book shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's big. I, I can't miss it. It's a giant book. Um, so let's see. I guess that's about it. Um, thank you last year, by the way, for uh, participating in my online <laughs> videos with the three camps yeah. and Connecticut halftime. That was so much fun to get all those drummers together. Absolutely. And... Well done you, you know, because the organization of that, you know, is, 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 you know, one thing and, and, uh, no, it was, it was great fun. And it was just kind of what was needed at the time, you know, um, just a little something that we could work towards and, and with, with the snare drum. And, and so thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it was a big learning curve. I didn't know how to do it before COVID, and COVID forced me to learn how to do some new things. Um, <laughs> have you has did the uh, shutdown um, force you to learn any new things or get any new skill sets? Oh gosh, uh, yes. Well, heavens, um, uh, technology, of course, which is not my my um, strong point. But I think as a whole, as a team, we had to kind of really, you know just be open to that and get on with it really and, and try and get through that as best as we can and, and readjust the business to virtual means. Um, so I think together as a team, we, we kind of embrace that and have done the best we can, you know. Um, and uh, I think from a from a, a, a player's point of view, what this whole situation has given me the chance to do, because I've been home-based, which has been quite nice, I have to say, selfishly, um, is that I gave myself the task of learning a new instrument each month or picking up an instrument that I hadn't picked up in a long, long time. So because I realized that, my gosh, you know, now that the concerts had um, and, and have evaporated, literally, it was like a pack of cars just going... Boo, 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 that suddenly the energy that you need for a performance had disappeared and it, because it, it doesn't happen through adding more hours of practice. You need the performance to, to get you mentally and physically, you know, onto that level. So that had all disappeared and I realized that the, the body needed to, to keep supple, basically. It needed to keep energized physically. So I started off, I think, last... Um, March to April on the Irish Boron and discovered that, my gosh, the techniques of playing that instrument has just escalated unbelievably. So all of this one-ended kind of style of playing, you know, normally I was a two-ended player before that, and that was about 30 years ago. So this was sort of, whoa, okay, that's really interesting. And I kept going with that. And then the next month was something like um, the bones and the spoons. And that, that took me into Russian spoons, Turkish spoons, you name it, spoons, you know, and lots of different nifty things there. And then the Indian kanjira, and then tabla and so on. And I understand that all of these things take more than a lifetime to, to I absolutely get that. But what's happened is that a lot of the techniques have, you know, I've kind of been able to okay, that's really interesting. Well, maybe I can use that approach for something else that I'm doing, you know, um, another musical thing that I might be working on or or whatever. And it's all of these, uh, going back to that very first lesson with my teacher, you know, of connecting all of the instruments together, um, because you know that you don't have enough hours in a day to to be practicing all of these things. And, you know, it, it's but what it's done is that it's opened me up to all sorts of music, to players, to ideas, techniques, you name it. And doing them with having to think, right, I have to get that ready for the 17th June 2022 for a particular concert. This is just as and when. So you're able to let things kind of go through your system. And it's been really nice to start right at the beginning with something again. So you're like that 12-year-old picking the sticks up for the first time and thinking, what do I do with these now? You know, how? <laughs> you know, this wonderment. And it's it's really, really lovely to have that kind of feeling again. That's fantastic. 
Um, with a name like Sean Kennedy, I feel obligated at some point to learn boron. I haven't done it yet, but I think I have to. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it, please do. And, and it, it's just fascinating. And, and, you know, the thing is, is that you can take everything that you learn on the boron, use it on a tambourine or, you know, use it on any kind of other drum or tip the snare drum up like a boron and see what happens when you're doing it. And, and you never know, you know, mm -hmm. where it might take you. <laughs> well, yeah, this was um, an incredible uh, gift for me to be able to speak to you and uh, ask you so many questions I've been uh, dying to ask you. So um, I hope you have a great rest of your uh, day and summer, and I look forward to seeing you playing live again soon, uh, maybe even around here back in the States. <laughs> thank you, Sean, and thank you for all the opportunities you've given to me. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this edition of Backstage at the Enharmonic with Dame Evelyn Glennie. To find out more about Dame Evelyn, please visit www.evelyn.co.uk. And please consider subscribing to this podcast, Backstage at the Enharmonic. Leave a rating uh, or review, recommend us to a friend, and to explore the entire catalog of my interviews, please visit me at www.evelyn.co.uk. Dot .seanjkennedy.com Thanks for listening. <laughs>